uh, some thoughts on the book of Ezra. Uh, the book of Ezra is a book which has three key dates within it. Uh, the first one is 536, which was when the people started re to return from Babylon to Jerusalem. Uh, the second one is 516 BC. Uh, this was when uh, the temple uh, was completed. And that takes us right to the end of chapter 6. There had been a period of 16 years when the work had stopped. Then there was a four-year period of getting back to building the temple. And then the temple was complete. Uh, the third date is uh, some 60 years later, in 458 BC, which is when we have chapters 7 to 10, which is the uh, return of the people with Ezra. Uh, it's good to have it in mind as we come to the book of uh, Ezra that it, it's part of the whole Bible story. The Bible is one coherent story. We need to be aware of that. I sometimes think we just view the Bible in parts, but it's one coherent story. It originates out of the heart of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, who share such a wonderful, beautiful, harmonious joy in relationship together, that they purpose that there would be a people who would join them as part of enjoying that relationship. And that is the story of the Bible, that the Lord might embrace a people to dwell with them. The outworking of that right throughout Scripture is that the Lord would have his people who are in his place to be for him, that he might dwell among them. And to be for him means that they are a people who worship, who serve and who obey. Now, take that into the book of Ezra then. The people have been taken away from their place down to Babylon, but now they are coming back to their place and they're coming back to worship. Cyrus is the king of Persia and he, in the sovereign purposes of God, gives the uh, decree uh, to build him a house. He says that it has come from the Lord, the God of heaven, that there would be uh, a house to be built for him. At Jerusalem, verse 2 of Ezra and chapter 1. And so we see in uh, chapter 1 the, the programme, the project is set out. In chapter 2 then we have the people. And there's this great long list uh, that leads uh, to a totalling up of 43,360 people. And the people uh, return. And then uh, we see in chapter 3 we see the a progress. The people are set to build. We see then in verse 11, and thus uh, they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord for his good and his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Some are mourning about the, uh, because they remember the old temple, some are rejoicing to see this new temple. A lot of noise going on at the end of chapter 3. Chapter 4 then we see uh, the opposition, the opposition. These uh, local people come and they say, well, we're all doing the same thing effectively. Let us all get together. And uh, Zerubbabel, who is the chief man, uh, says no. And uh, along with the Jeshua and the rest of the heads in verse 3, they said, you have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord the God of Israel. And so we have in chapter 4 the dealings with the issues of opposition. It seems to go uh, right down the uh, the age to 458 BC. When you get verse 7, you'll see that that's a, another opposition uh, passage. But it's all about opposition. And then as you come into chapter 5, we see things start up again. Things have stopped for 16 years uh, and now... They start up again and they uh, 
Uh, start up through the preaching of Haggai and Zechariah. If you look at the book of Haggai, Haggai chapter 1, you see all the people who just got used to their nice posh houses and they've forgotten the temple of the Lord and Haggai is preaching to rouse them up. Uh, he is rousing them up that this temple would be a place of, of worship for all nations. The people of God established this place to be a place of worship for all. And so the work uh, goes forward and uh, finally... Uh, we see that it is completed and then we see all these uh, sacrifices that are taking place in chapter 6 and verse uh, 16 to 18. And now if you get the connection with scripture and you go back to 1 Kings in chapter 8, you'll be expecting when the temple is rebuilt, you'd be expecting what? When all the sacrifices are made, you'll be expecting the great, great, great full uh, presence of the Lord. Uh, descending upon the tab uh, the temple to signify the Lord dwelling, but it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. The sacrifices have made, made, but no Shekinah comes into the temple, and it leads us thinking: we must, we want the presence of God. The presence of God is needed, and we're aching for the presence of God to come. And finally, it does come when the temple arrives. The presence of God arrives, not in a building, but in a person, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go on to Ezra then, and uh, we'll see he arrives in 458 uh, BC, and he comes, uh, he's a great preacher. There's wonderful verse, isn't it, in uh, Ezra chapter 7 and, uh, and verse 10, uh, when we read concerning him, this is uh, uh, said of him. Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So the people come back uh, uh, with Ezra. This uh, this familiar refrain that's in verse 6, for example, of chapter 7. The hand of his God was on him. Very much the workings of the Lord to bring uh, uh, the people back. And they come back and they arrive back in uh, Jerusalem. There's all these people, these priests, and they're all coming. They seem a devoted group of people. See chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. They're fasting, their commitment uh, to, the, to the Lord. And then they come back in chapter 8 and verse 35. And again we see the offerings. Again we see the uh, celebration of being back at the temple. But again the presence of the Lord does not fall. No Shekinah again, and we're left wondering again. Everything seems so right, these devoted people, and then you see what's wrong in chapter 9. You will see things have gone wrong. There are these intermarryings. Verse 1 of chapter 9 says, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people's verse two, for they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons. Sin has come in. Uh, there is this pollution of the purity of the people of God with these intermarryings with those who are in the locality. And look at uh, look at Ezra praying as so we burst into verse. Uh, Verse uh, verse six, you'll see. Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to, blush to lift my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Oh, here's a man who's grief stricken concerning their sin. And go into chapter eight, and uh, uh, we see the uh, there is a uh, a a, um, a desire amongst the people uh, to get things sorted out. And uh, you can see this great uh, look in verse 9 of chapter 10. And all the men of Judah and the Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter, because of the heavy rain. Ezra speaks and makes declaration. And verse 14, let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all our cities who have taken, let all our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times. And with them, uh, the elders and the judges of every city until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. So the 
conclusion is arrived at uh, that they are going to deal with this matter. But just some thoughts about this matter. It's 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 a messy situation. The whole thing is messy. You know, first of all, you look at uh, you you see everybody's not on board. Uh, verse uh, fifteen. Uh, and, and then you think, well, Malachi, who was prophesying around about this time, if you read what he says in Malachi and chapter chapter 2, you say that the Lord hates divorce, and yet they are divorcing. And then we're left to think, well, what happened to these wives and their children? And we're, we're just wondering what's going on here. With the, there seems to be some good dealing with sin, and we're left thinking, will there be any true dealing with sin? Will it be cleanly and perfectly dealt with? And we praise God that there comes a time. You, you see, we're aching. Sin must be dealt with. Will it be dealt with properly? And we, there comes a time when our Lord Jesus comes and he deals with sin properly. He goes to the cross, everything fully, totally, wholly dealt with by our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, there is a perfect dealing with sin. So just some thoughts on the book of Ezra and how the Lord is working at those times. Thanks.